Well, let's have a look at some of the new updates into the Salesforce connector. So I'll begin by just adding that to the design canvas. Good. If we have a look at that connection, you're going to notice one difference on this connection immediately. We've got the usual suspects, so a URL if you need to provide that to um, override the location of your org. You shouldn't need to do that. Then you've got your username and password as always. There's a consumer se secret and key associated with that and then a security token that validates your user account. And the steps on how to validate that or, or configure that are defined or are specified in the help article. Then we've had this added this new property, don't interleave requests in response. I'll show you what that's for in a second. By default, that's going to be turned off and it's going to provide an enhanced fun functionality that we didn't have in previous versions. So if I go into the workflow, let's add a Salesforce connector. Uh, I've chosen a connection and I'm going to go and choose a sample. Uh, just like before, this is going to do a live enumeration of all of the objects available. And I can go and find, for example, the create contact sample. Uh, it's going to go and add those fields onto the canvas for me. And in the request, I now get a specimen payload of the contact record. The only field that's actually required here is last name. So for purposes of our demo, I'm just going to use that. Um, and like before, you can do these calls in batches as well. So you just repeat the contact element. So I'll do, do something like that. That's fine. And then let's go and run the stage and see what it does. You'll also notice a performance improvement. We're caching the sessions now, so and we're doing that across um, workflow instances and across workflows as well. So after the initial session's been established, there's none of that overhead going on, and you'll see these calls start to execute much more quickly. You'll particularly get a batch performance um, improvement if you're using an iterator and you're making multiple requests to that Salesforce node. So um, if we have a look at the response that's come out on the other side now, this looks a little bit different. So this is a, f a flat view that we've always had, but you'll notice some extra field here. And particularly what's happening in here is a um, couple of things. First of all, the status code that we had in here previously was not necessarily end user friendly. It was returning the HTTP status code. And what we're doing now is returning the text for that status code instead. So it, this obviously is now signaling that these are two contacts that have been created for me. Then you've got the result tag. We've always had this. And in this case, it's providing the ID of the item that it just generated, as well as the flag that you can um, evaluate on if you're going to use an if statement or something like that. But what we've also added now is this request element. So you can choose to interleave the request in with the response. So if you're creating 10 items, you get 10 results back, but interleaved with that are the 10 requests that made that up. And this is really useful if you need to do some subsequent processing on that response so that you don't have to manually correlate the data that came into Salesforce with the data that came out. So from here, for example, if I had an email address in my original request, I'd be able to correlate the email address with the ID that, I got that ultimately got generated. And I could use that in something like Quick Map or on something like uh, maybe the set key values node if I was processing things in batch. Now, this is an optional setting. It's going to be included by default. If you specifically don't want it, that's where the new property comes in on the connection. So at the bottom of the screen here, don't interleave requests in response. You're welcome to uh, flip that on. It will not put the results property in. There's only really a few cases that, that might be something you'd want to do. The main one is if you're processing a, a very large amount of data there will be a little bit of overhead with this interleaving. So you'll be able to save some milliseconds of processing time by doing that. And then also it will bloat the response because the response is including everything that was in the request and then some. So if you want to reduce the size of the activity logs, those are two reasons. But we've enabled the setting by default because it's something that will generally be useful for everyone. All right, so that's the create action um, pretty much as it has always been. Um, let's have a look now at something like the update action. I'm going to just use the context again as an example of that. Now, um, previously, it wasn't possible to do batch updates on um, uh, objects inside Salesforce. So that's something that we fixed in this version. The payloads do look the same. You'll notice that when specimen data generates, the update action is now going to provide an ID. So that's the ID item that you're going to be able to do an update against. So if I just look at the request that I sent in last time around, um, we can use that as the basis. So these are the two contacts, but I want to actually do an update on them. So I need to provide the ID field. And so I can just grab those out of the response. So here's the one ID. And I'm just going to go and add those into the property here. And let's go grab the other ID from the response from our last iteration. And we'll put that as the, the second item. Of course, I'm hard coding all of this. Normally, you're going to be generating all of this through something like um, Quick Map. Let's run that and see what it does. So it's finished with that update operation.
And if I have a look at the response that's coming out, it's giving me a no content response. That's just Salesforce saying, I don't need to give you anything back because the only thing it needs to give us back is the ID or an error message. Obviously, the ID hasn't changed because we supplied it to begin with. So that's what that response means. And then again, you can see in, in here, this is the request object that is being interleaved with that response. So if there was something in result, you'd now be able to correlate that with the request. So it's a batch update process. Uh, that's been put in place. What we've also added in this version is an upsert. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, what an upsert means is do uh, an update if the item already exists, but if it doesn't, do a create. So there are now upsert samples on all of these items as well. Upsert contact, for example. Again, the, the structure of this is very similar. Um, so I'm going to just use the request that we had a moment ago. And uh, before we do that, we'll just have a look at it. So you'll see the upsert example does include the ID of that object. I'm just going to do this. So here is the ID of an item that obviously already exists. And we could call that like new last name. And let's call this uh, third item. But this one we're going to remove that ID from. So effectively, we're telling it to update that item because it has an ID, but to create that item because it does not have an ID. And you can compose those in a single request now with this new uh, version. So let's hit the play button and see what that does. And if we look at the response now, I'll just go straight into the XML view on that. Here are the results for the um, item that we're updating. So it's telling me that there's a no content response. In other words, there was nothing further it needed to do or, or no further information it needed to r um, respond back with uh, because it's just an update. And it's also helpfully inserted the URL to that object if I wanted to access that API directly. And then in the case of the other one, the source code that's come back is created. And you can see there's the ID of that item. So upsert is seamlessly uh, going to be supported as well. Now, there's one last capability that applies to the update and the upsert features. And that's this external ID field. So inside Salesforce, when you're creating an object, uh, and you're adding fields onto that object, you can specify that certain of those fields are what they call external IDs. If you choose to provide one or more external IDs, you can actually have the update or upsert update operations keyed on the field that you specify here rather than the uh, the field called ID, the standard Salesforce primary key field. This is really useful. So for example, if you're updating a set of inventory items, Salesforce obviously has their own internal uh, alphanumeric uh, primary key for that item. But maybe you need to have a stock code or an SKU as a primary key. So you can go into the inventory items object and ex add an external ID called SKU or stock code for argument's sake. And then in this field, you could say, actually, my primary key for the update is going to be SKU. And it, it's not going to look like this. You must use the exact name that Salesforce generates, and it does show up in the sample and then you'll be able to key on that item inside the request. Um, I'll show you how that actually looks. If we go back to the upsert operation, I'll just pull up a, a sample of it, and I have added a, a key right at the bottom. So this here, flow your test external ID, that was the internal field name that I specified, and this is what Salesforce generates as the field name. So if I now took this and put that as the primary key, I'd be able to key my updates based on that field. And in that case, I would just need, rather than to, to supply the ID field, I would just need to supply you know any required fields or any fields that have changed. So for example, last name and then the key field that I've chosen to key on. So that's a really useful way to avoid having to do extra round trips to be able to do those correlations. You also don't even need to use things like um, the key value pair uh, nodes. You can actually directly set to an external key.